So for the final lecture in Architecture 345, I want to talk a little bit about uh, these stability techniques actually in practice. And I want to look at one set of historic examples, high-rise construction in the 1880s, uh, way back when, and then one that's a little bit more current, a project that I worked on uh, in the late 90s that dealt not with wind, but with this other big stability uh, problem that we deal with, uh, seismic stability, right? the, the uh, ability of a building to stand up uh, even in a big earthquake. If we go back and look at early skyscrapers, we see plans that look very different from what we expect today. Today we usually look at uh, tiny steel or concrete columns and very, very thin uh, curtain walls. Back in the 1880s, those would have been supplemented by giant brick walls. And these walls, you can see here in the Tacoma building, four walls made out of solid masonry, 18 to 24 inches thick. Uh, these walls were designed both to help carry the gravity loads, but they were really the building's only defense against wind. Um, they're called shear walls. We talked about these as one of the techniques that we typically use uh, today, mostly in cores. Uh, but as you can see here in the 1880s, they are spread throughout the entire building. And the architects here, the engineers really, uh, are using the strength of brick, the stiffness of brick, uh, to build these giant walls, basically cantilevered beams, but instead of sticking out into space, they're sticking up from the ground. And what they're doing is they are using the stiffness of brick to maintain that rectangular shape. The wind is trying to turn those brick walls into parallelograms. The brick has some natural strength and stiffness. It's resisting uh, that racking on its own, and that is lending that stiffness to the, to the building as a whole. Now, that works fine. Tacoma building stood for about 50 years, um, but imagine if you're a developer trying to uh, lease these floor plates or a tenant who wants to maybe expand to grow their business. Um, you have these giant walls that are literally in the way uh, of that expansion. And in fact, the Tacoma was demolished in the 1940s because there was no way to create these larger open floor plans that, that clients, uh, tenants uh, wanted. The reason that those walls were so important is that engineers had no choice. Um, they were lacking the one material that allows us to build very stiff metal frames today. Uh, they were stuck with either cast or wrought iron. Steel was out there, but it was an incredibly expensive uh, material, time consuming to produce, and it was really reserved for things like weapons or fine uh, dining ware, things like that. It didn't really have uh, very much application in, in buildings until the late 1880s. The metals that engineers did have, cast iron and wrought iron, had complementary properties, but properties that made uh, getting stiffness into a building frame really difficult. Cast iron, as you can see, uh, literally made by taking raw iron ore, melting it, pouring it into molds, uh, and then when it's cooled, taking those elements out. Very, very high compressive strength, right? Very, very good for columns, um, but it's a very brittle material and it's relatively unreliable in tension. So the unreliability in tension makes it bad for beams. Remember we said that beams uh, use a combined resistance to compression and tension to resist bending. And it, the cast iron's brittle nature meant that you couldn't drill or cut it once it was out of the mold. If you wanted to put a, a bolt through a cast iron piece, you had to actually cast the hole into it uh, in, the, in the mold itself. Now it's complement wrought iron was made by a very different process, melting that iron ore, paying laborers with scoops to literally take the carbon deposits out of the molten iron. Very time consuming process, very dangerous process, and thus a really, really expensive one. Wrought iron was almost a, a, a precious metal, but it has very good tensile strength, 2,800 to 3,700 kilograms per square centimeter. So two, three, maybe even four times the tensile strength of cast iron. And this combined with its reasonable compressive strength made it good for beams. So typically, you would have a skyscraper frame that had cast iron columns, wrought iron beams. Wrought iron is ductile, meaning you can cut and, and drill it, but it had to connect with these very imprecise uh, cast iron pieces. And thus, 
any frame that used wrought and cast iron together was necessarily loose. You could cast a bolt hole into a, a cast iron column, but you had to make it a little bit bigger than uh, it needed to be because there was no way uh, to know exactly where it was gonna end up on the site. You could put a pin through that and a wrought iron beam. Uh, you would have a, a loose kind of janky connection, could handle the gravity loads, but it would need those brick walls to stabilize it. Now, in the late 1880s, this kind of wonder material comes along. Uh, Henry Bessemer invents a way to make steel on a kind of industrial scale. The price comes down, and by carefully controlling the amount of carbon in the iron ore, uh, you could get a, a material that had compressive and tensile strengths that were exactly equal. So reasonably good in uh, compression for columns, but because it's equal in compressive and tensile strength, it's perfect for beams. It can handle that pairing of compression and tension that we get in bending elements. More critical though, it was as ductile as wrought iron, which meant now that you had columns and beams both made of material that you could roll into thin pieces, cut, drill very precisely, you could get those tight connections that you couldn't get uh, with cast iron columns. Wrought iron, even though it was expensive, was used a, a great deal for bridge construction, railroad bridge construction in particular. The economics of getting uh, train cars over a bridge were much more intense than simply building a skyscraper. So wrought iron was used uh, to make trusses for bridges that went over uh, rivers as the railroads went west. Those principles were literally turned 90 degrees up into the air by skyscraper engineers in the 1880s once they had an affordable material that could get them the precision that wrought iron allowed. So here from the 1890s, you see a textbook that says, well, you know, if you take these principles from bridge design, you get pretty much the techniques we were talking about in the last video, cross bracing, knee braces, and portal frames. None of those are really possible in cast iron because the material is so brittle, it's hard to get uh, precision connections, right? This is what a typical uh, page of cast iron details looks like. Uh, a few holes cast in, but really no tight bolts possible, just kind of loose uh, pins that are gonna uh, stick elements together and that will need those big bracing walls uh, to hold them up. But here is what can, those connections look like in steel. And because you can cut uh, uh, steel very precisely, because you can drill it after it comes off of the, the rolling mill, you can get what are called riveted connections, red hot bits of steel that are hammered in uh, to connections between girders and columns. You can make cross bracing, you can make uh, knee braces, you can make portal frames, and here one of the first uh, moment connections that we, we know of in a building called the Reliance in Chicago, where a slightly oversized girder uh, joins a, a column here and just has as many rivets driven into it as precisely and as completely and as tightly as you possibly can. So here, the stiffness of the connection means that any lateral force on the building, the connection is gonna stay at 90 degrees. Those rivets aren't going anywhere. All of the columns in the building all of the girders in the building uh, have to go into bending. And literally every structural element in the entire building frame is going to be recruited, as the engineers say, uh, to resisting that wind load. And here are examples, uh, mostly from Chicago, the, the windy city where they were maybe uh, more uh, attuned to the need for wind bracing than elsewhere. Here is a portal frame in a skyscraper by Holliburton Roche, same company that did the Tacoma. But now look, instead of those big, thick, heavy shear walls, they have taken these portal frames, very similar to ship construction. They have put two sets of portal frames where they would ordinarily put shear walls. Note that they're spaced pretty evenly apart. There's a big uh, firewall that they use for shear resistance at, the, at one end of the building. And then these two lines of portal frames uh, stiffen the rest of the, of the building because they're evenly spaced. That keeps the building from twisting in, in ways that might be harmful to the structure. And here I think it's really easy to see what's happening. Uh, if a wind blowing from left to right hits the building, uh, that connection between the column here and the girder there 
that is going to stay perpendicular. It's going to stay at 90 degrees because there is no way that all of this steel is just going to fold up uh, and get out of the way. Instead, what's going to happen is that for the building to deform or to rack at all, every single girder and every single column is going to have to bend a little bit. And so that wind is up against the combined strength or really the combined stiffness of every single structural member uh, on that line of, of columns in the building. It is, again, those connections, because they're so stiff, are recruiting all of the structural elements into resisting the wind. Now, here is a, literally a railroad truss uh, turned on its end. Uh, the, the idea that, that was that skyscrapers in Chicago were quote-unquote built like bridges. And here you can imagine that this looks exactly like a, a truss bridge that now instead of joining two points in space is simply sticking up uh, from the building foundations. Those wind trusses are along these two lines in the building. And if you look closely, you can see that where there needs to be a corridor or where there uh, are exits onto this kind of uh, elevator lobby, uh, you can see that there are no wind trusses there, but the wind trusses instead are confined to the areas where the architecture can allow for uh, solid partitions. They don't take up anywhere near the amount of space in the building that brick shear walls would have taken up, but they do the same job. And here that is to triangulate the building all the way down to the ground so that any uh, wind blowing left to right, um, all of the, uh, the cords of that truss in this direction are going to go into tension. They're going to grab the building, hold on to it, and that's going to pass the wind load down into the foundations. Now, things get really interesting when uh, an engineer named E.C. Shankland designs first for the Reliance, that one connection that we looked at a minute ago, and then for this building, the Fisher building, uh, in uh, 1896, what are called moment connections. And if you look at the Fisher building, there are not only no uh, 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 brick walls, but there's no cross bracing. There are no portal frames. Shankland developed moment connections that literally uh, tied in every single column with every single girder, and thus the entire structure of the building, every single element, uh, gets recruited into uh, bracing against the wind. In fact, uh, the local press said that this was uh, the Fisher building was the first building without walls, right? Without uh, any brick either inside the building holding it up. And because it pioneered the use of this material called enamel terracotta, no bricks in any of the cladding, uh, they thought this was something completely new. And it is, in fact, maybe more like the way we would do a modern steel high rise. Uh, than any building that, that went before it. Notice you can see right through the building frame, right? There's no shear walls, there's no cross bracing, but if you look, you can see that the girders are all maybe a little bit deeper uh, than they might need to be. And that is to get a, a good deep connection between the girder uh, and, and the column that it's framing into. So that makes a stiff enough connection that it can maintain its 90 degree angle uh, and thus force all of the columns, all of the girders in the frame uh, to go into bending. And today you see occasional kind of tributes to this sort of engineering. Uh, here, uh, the Joffrey Ballet Tower, uh, quite near actually some of uh, the buildings we just looked at. And you can see that the architects here have chosen to express, you can see each of these little torque box boxes uh, in the, the steelwork on the outside. Um, those are expressing the idea that this is one giant moment frame and that it is relying no longer on riveted connections, but in this case, welded connections to spread the lateral uh, forces, the, the stresses that the wind is putting onto this pretty tall building uh, throughout every single member by way of those really, really stiff connections. Okay, the last one I want to show you is uh, from, from my own experience. It's a, a lab building uh, at Stanford University uh, that we did in the late 90s. We worked with uh, Overup and Partners, engineers, uh, to design it. It's not a particularly tall building. Uh, it's four to five stories, uh, four stories with a basement. Um, but it is located less than two miles from the San Andreas Fault. And so while we weren't at all worried about wind uh, in, in the building, it's not really tall enough, uh, to make us worry about that. Uh, Stanford and uh, Arabs, and of course we were very worried about what would happen in a severe earthquake. Uh, Stanford uh, had just passed some new seismic criteria. 
and they wanted the building to be fully operational uh, even after a 7.0 earthquake, which is a really, really big one, and they wanted the building to be survivable uh, in uh, an earthquake of 8.0 or greater, right? Larger than any earthquake that's ever hit uh, the Bay Area. So we, working with Arabs, uh, at first came up with uh, an idea that uh, was in steel. We were going to do the building in steel, which allows for those very stiff connections, but is also ductile. It has the uh, stability to resist lateral forces, but it also bends instead of breaking. Uh, and this is a, a, a crucial thing with seismic design because the accelerations are so fast back and forth. Um, the the uh, concrete in particular, because it's brittle, uh, has a tendency to crack or to just break uh, under seismic loading. So the conventional wisdom is that you do earthquake resistant buildings out of steel. But when we proposed this, what we found was that the equipment that scientists were using or were going to use in this lab included scanning electron microscopes. And any building that was flexible enough or ductile enough to take advantage of, uh, of steel's kind of ability to bend and not break was going to be so flexible that even footfall vibration in one part of the building would throw off an experiment or an imaging uh, run in another. So Stanford turns around to us and says, well, you're stuck with concrete. And Arabs, after doing some calculations, say, well, if we can put together a very, very simple, very, very thorough stability uh, plan, uh, we can guarantee that the building will meet these criteria. Um, it's just going to require us going back to these pre-1890s ideas about giant shear walls, concrete now instead of masonry, but relying on 18, 24-inch thick shear walls, which you can see here, and here, uh, lining one of the one of the entrances to the building, um, and making sure that those are evenly distributed in ways that will stiffen the building against earthquakes in in any direction. So we uh, got to work. We were planning a, a generic laboratory module that was about 30 feet wide, about 50 feet deep. It had offices that needed uh, privacy and fire protection. It had a core area where all of these uh, very delicate instruments were going to be located. And then it had the lab benches themselves where uh, researchers would actually be doing their work. The core area could be divided up into little tiny rooms. That was no problem, didn't need daylight. Offices needed daylight, but they needed acoustic privacy, and the labs really wanted to be wide open. Uh, the medical school wanted researchers to be able to see one another, to be able to circulate freely without those kind of interruptions that uh, masonry walls made in, in those early skyscrapers. And so working with Arabs, we kind of put these giant shear walls where they would work both structurally and functionally. The most obvious thing to do was to wrap the uh, core, the mechanical core, or the uh, equipment core, uh, with a shear wall on, one, on, on either side of it. Um, eventually, what we realized was that these giant concrete walls would not only provide seismic prote uh, protection and, and a good part of the building structure, but they would also provide fire protection and potentially acoustic protection for the offices. So if a fire breaks out in the core, um, the concrete walls on either side kind of uh, maintain it or you know, keep it uh, uh, isolated. And if we were to lay out every lab module exactly the same, which was something that Stanford wanted, we would get this very, very regular kind of march of uh, shear walls down the, down the building plan. So that gave us stability in the east-west direction, right? Very, very easy. Every module has two giant shear walls going all the way down to the foundation uh, that collectively stiffen the building against earthquakes in the east-west direction. In the other direction, we didn't want to close off the lab and we wanted to give researchers the flexibility to plan their equipment spaces kind of uh, left to right. So the Shear walls in the other direction literally just wrapped around the offices, uh, gave them all of the, um, uh, the fire protection that they would need, and also gave them some acoustic isolation so that noise from the equipment or noise from the labs uh, wouldn't, wouldn't bother the, the faculty in those offices. Um, we also wrapped them around the entrances to the building, uh, and every other one of these we used for either a fire stair or a bathroom. And those are both good things to put shear walls around, right? Remember from the Shanghai Tower, 
that when we're doing cores, we tend to put shear walls next to things that run the length of the building or the height of the building vertically. So fire stair is one of those. Uh, bathroom is another. So these ended up being the perfect places for shear walls that gave us then stability in the north-south direction. What we realized as we went on was that there was a kind of psychological benefit to seeing these big, heavy concrete walls. If you were a, a California resident, that gave you some reassurance, right? The building felt strong and you knew what to grab onto if, if and when the building uh, started shaking. So in the labs themselves, you can see here is one of those shear walls. It's got stuff, of course, tacked uh, all over it, but it's concrete, so that's fine. You know, it, it can take it, and people see where the, the building's stiffness is. Um, if they feel more secure about it, they can run to one of those shear walls and, and hug it. Uh, but as Arab's simulation showed, um, they would be safe virtually anywhere in the building. The one kind of punchline to this, we thought we had solved the stability problem uh, in scheme, schematic design when we first did the seismic calculations and figured out where we needed these big thick shear walls to go. But stability came back when we were doing furniture design and particularly when we were designing the laboratory shelves. What happens in an earthquake is that the earth is literally moving, right? And it's taking everything connected with it along for the ride. So when a tectonic plate moves, there's a vibration that's set up, the tectonic plate shakes back and forth. The building is firmly connected to the ground, so it's shaking back and forth. The shear walls are firmly connected to the foundations, so they're going back and forth. And everything about the, the everything inside the building that's attached to the building frame uh, is moving along with it. Now, as the building is whipping back and forth, it can experience speeds of like 25 or 30 miles an hour. Um, over very, very short distances. But nevertheless, those accelerations are really, really rapid. Anything that's not attached to the building frame is gonna tend to want to stay in space, right? Newtonian physics. So all of these books, all of these binders, all of these chemical reagents, they wanna stay in the same place in space while the building is whipping back and forth. And what we realized as we were doing, as we were designing the shelves, was that what that meant was that binders, chemical reagents, lab equipment would come flying off that shelf at up to 25 or 30 miles an hour in an earthquake. And that's enough to really hurt someone. So the last stability detail in the building is this little lip that you see on all of the shelf edges that are gonna arrest, hopefully, anything that, it's, that is trying to stay in the same place in space while the building is whipping back and forth uh, and prevent it from flying out uh, and braining one of, one of Stanford's researchers. A little unexpected detail, structural design uh, shows up sometimes where you least expect it, um, but this is also testament to the kind of pervasiveness of the structure that it, it deals literally with every bit of the building. Every bit of the building has to stand up Every bit of the building has to be strong enough to carry its loads and to meet any unanticipated uh, event like a, a windstorm or an earthquake. Happy to say that the building has survived a couple of earthquakes, nothing really uh, that big. Uh, 6.0 is the, is the biggest it's gone through, but it was just fine uh, afterwards. With that, uh, we'll wrap up your first uh, structures class. Congratulations. We'll see you back here next term uh, in 346 when we'll start to look a little bit more, uh, in a little bit more detail uh, at both how we put structural elements together and how we use them to meet uh, various architectural functions. We'll start to look also in more detail at how engineers design them and what our role is in that process, how we use structure, uh, not just as a kind of way to hold up the building, but also often uh, as architectural vocabulary.